Okay, it turns out I need a seventh video. I'm very disturbed about this, but I need to post it. I'm trying to go arguing against myself because I don't have anybody else to argue against. What would invalidate what I told you? True scientific method. First you go in one direction, then you go in the opposite direction, each getting its voice, and somewhere in the middle ought to be the truth. Um, so that's what I'm testing here. If you look on the right hand side of the screen, and if you can't read the Greek, just take my word for it, um, the words that are highlighted in red and yellow um, are the Greek word tereo, which is highlighted in blue on the left hand side, translated kept. It means to keep, to guard, to hold, to protect, to cherish, to hold close. It's an extremely important word in the book of John. And one of the ways you establish order in Bible books is the way keywords are used. That's also how you establish if one writer is playing on another Bible book, is the use of keywords. So if you look on the right hand side, I searched on both Peter letters and on Jude and, and this is important, on the book of Hebrews. Okay. The word kept, to keep, tereo in Greek, is not at all in the book of Hebrews. That's disturbing. The implication is either that the book of Hebrew that the book of Hebrews was written after Peter and Jude. It's still going to be 68 A.D. because Paul is dead, and Peter knows Paul is dead in his letter. So maybe Hebrews is written at the end with Mark's gospel. Okay, because Mark's gospel uses the word Torah. Um, but the book of Hebrews doesn't. And the question is why? See how important it is on the right hand side. You got <clears throat> 1 Peter 1, 1 4, 2, 4, 2, 9. 2, 2 se 2 Peter is using it even more. Okay, then Jude is using it again as a key phrase, which is a lot for a small letter like he's writing. Okay, that's a, that's a stress. Okay, on you know using the verb to rattle. It's an extremely important word in the book of John, uh, especially in the book, the gospel, and in uh, first, second, and third John, especially first John. Okay, it's really, really important keyword. It is one of the many key words that are used in the Bible for once saved, always saved. The idea is that once you're saved, you're kept for Jesus Christ. You're his property. That's one of the many reasons why you can't lose salvation. You are not your own. The minute you believed in Christ, you are his property. That's Isaiah 53, 12. Okay? So you are kept for him. You're his property. You're reserved for him him whether you like it or not too bad okay and that was what that thing that Paul was talking about how the Lord cannot deny himself all right I already showed that in the, in the videos okay so why is it that the book of Hebrews does not have this keyword and I don't know the answer to that there are other keywords that are of similar meaning but not this one so the implication is that the book of Hebrews is either is after both Jude and Peter. So it would be then Peter, then Jude, then book of Hebrews. Okay, and Mark uses Torah. And of course John uses it as a cornerstone word. So now why, and so does the book of Revelation, which is also by John. So why is it missing from the book of Hebrews? I don't have an answer, but that might it vary. That might be a clue that the book of Hebrews is it's is later. So it would be Peter, then Jude. For sure that order is correct. Then maybe the book of Hebrews, and then maybe Mark's gospel. I don't have any more information to give you right now. Signing off. All right. Um, I'm almost positive now that the book of Hebrews comes out after Peter. So it would be Peter, Jude, then Hebrews. 
I'm still not sure if Mark is coming out at the same time or after Hebrews. But the more I look at this, the more I realize that the book of Hebrews is elaborating on <clears throat> what Peter wrote. Now, since this is all coming out in a 12-month window, what it has to mean is that God was coordinating different minds on the same topics. Because Peter's in Babylon when he writes 1 Peter. We see that at the end of his letter. And he can't be writing here except that Paul's dead. All right? So basically, Paul's death triggers the advice to Peter, which he says in 2 Peter, not in 1 Peter. So he didn't know right away. The fact of Paul's death triggers 1 Peter. All right? Because he's writing to Paul's own stomping ground, as shown right here. But when you look at the themes of First Peter, every single thing he talks about is elaborated on in, in Hebrews. Peter himself is not talking about, he's not talking back to Hebrews. But the themes of Hebrews are elaborated on, wrap around what Peter writes. That it's just as it's just like the way Mark's gospel wraps around Luke and Matthew. I'm convinced of that now. You know, if, if I was 20 years old, I and women were allowed to be in seminary. I would, they're allowed, but I I don't think spiritually we should go there. If I was a man and I was 20 years old, I would do my dissertation on this. Okay, this is so important to understand. But I can't, so I've got to do a sort of like slipshod, semi-slipshod version of it to you. And maybe one of you guys are in seminary and you'll do your dissertation on this. All right, so think of this as like a seed or brainstorming or something. I don't know. God knows what to make out of it. Okay, but I have to, I have to conclude something. So here's where I'm getting my conclusion. All right, first of all, Paul's dead. That's what this verse shows us. Okay, then he gets into a James-like thing right here. James wrote the same way. Just before James died, he wrote, well, maybe not just before he died, but he wrote James with the same theme of trials. Okay, so he's setting up, hi, you're undergoing trials, remember where you're going. That's always important in the Christian life. It's not who you are now. It's not where you are now. It's where you're going. Okay? All right, so see, trials. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. All right? Now look, proof of your faith, more precious, tested by fire, result in praise and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's dying in 68. They were expecting the rapture to occur when the temple would go down. I've established that already in my GGS videos when I showed Paul's meter. Paul's meter in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14 is a sort of rollout of what if the rapture happens this year? And then it gets the, the likelihood of the rapture becomes less and less and less. And then by the time he gets to Constantine, because Paul's being prophetic, by the time he gets to Constantine, Ephesians 1.12, Greek word is proel. The whole word is proel picotas. But Constantine dies at proel. So Constantine is, is being depicted as apostate. By the time he gets to proel picotas, he doesn't meet her anymore. Ephesians 1.13 and 14 are all one meter. They don't divide by seven until the end of verse 14. So he's, by doing that meter that way, he's telling you the likelihood of the rapture is almost zero after that. In other words, Christianity gets so apostate, it'll be like a miracle for the rapture to occur because people aren't maturing in Christ. But at this point, which is after Paul wrote, 
At this point, when Peter writes in 68 AD, in Paul's meter, the likelihood of the rapture was really high. Okay? And everybody was expecting it based on the old law because the church was supposed to, you know, church came into existence in 30 AD. And then there was another 40 years that were still owed on the Mosaic timeline that were still owed to the temple. I explained that in my videos in Psalm 90. So that's why everybody was expecting the rapture to occur with the temple going down or three years prior in Paul's chronology. Okay? So Peter's like, wow, it can happen right now. All right? So that's why he's writing on this. Because if it can happen right now, it's going to be really bad before it happens. Okay? For, for Christians. See, because the temple is supposed to go down in the middle of the tribulation. Okay, well, is the, is the, is the rapture going to occur right now because Paul's dead? Because the temple was expected to go down three years from when Peter writes. Okay, it was either, it was either what we would call 70 AD, which is really when it happened, or it was in 73 AD. It depends on how you know, the Roman time versus our BC AD dates. Peter and everybody else in those days weren't using our BC AD. They had their own Anno Domini that Paul had plotted out. So they were expecting the rapture right away. Okay? So that's why he's saying, even if it's for a little while longer, because it could happen any second. All right? So that's why he's saying, you know, get ready, get ready, get ready. All right, and and that's why he's starting this thing out here, okay. And then he goes back to remind them of what the salvation is that they have, and see here, here, this is what this is what the jumping off point of Hebrews one, okay. That's the jumping off point of the verse. All right, so he's saying the prophets were writing knowing about you, see. See how he's talking about angels? And he's talking about the prophets. That's how Hebrews 1 opens. Okay? Therefore, get ready. Alright? Don't be conformed. He's quoting Paul here, Romans 12. Okay? Not all, not only that, but... Okay? And then he's talking about holiness. And then he's going to get into, in the next chapter, the priesthood. Okay? Talking about worrying about judging, okay? Because, see, the rapture could come. That's 1 Corinthians 3, we'll be judged. See, silver or gold, he's talking back to 1 Corinthians 3. All right? Precious blood, blood of Christ, foundation. Again, he's talking back to 1 Corinthians 3, all right? I mean, he's not just doing that, but that's part of it, okay? And, and now, down here... This is definitely he's talking rapture because he's talking back to Psalm 90 verse 4. They were expecting the tribulation to begin imminently because seven years and then you got the second advent which is the thousand year reign of Christ and that's why he's quoting Psalm 90 there. Okay. So then he starts talking about you know pure milk of the word Hebrews 5, 12, and 13 plays on that. Okay? If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, that's Hebrews 6. Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 6 is talking back to this. I didn't realize until just now just how much the book of Hebrews is wrapping around Peter. Okay? Living stone because the temple's about to go down. That's why this is all so important. Okay, and that's why he talks next because the temple needed a priesthood. That's why he talks next next about the priesthood. Okay, but that's the central theme of Hebrews two through ten, is the change in the priesthood because the temple's going to go down because Christ went behind the veil. Okay, this is a central theme in the book of Hebrews. It's a it's a comprehensive explanation of the change in covenant due to the change in priesthood. Okay? So it's like the book of Hebrews is stopping at certain points in Peter 
and then elaborating on Peter. I didn't notice this connection until just now. Okay? Aliens and strangers, that's how the book of Hebrews starts to end. Okay? Keep your behavior excellent, that's in Hebrews 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Okay? All this behavior stuff, that's in Hebrews 13. Actually starts in like the, the pass him in verse uh, in chapter 12. Okay? Servants, be submissive. Okay? See all this behavioral stuff? All right? For you were continually straying like sheep. Okay? I mean, hello. All right? And then he goes into the wives. And this is how um, Hebrews 13 is talking. Again, the same thing. It's in different order in the book of Hebrews because it stops and elaborates on the covenant. The whole theme of the book of Hebrews is the change of covenant, change of priesthood. Priesthood, see? Focusing on this. All right? And then you've got the behavioral stuff that's a, that's primarily in Hebrews 13 because what else does he need to say if Peter already talked about it so much? All right? And, of course, Paul had already talked about it in Ephesians 6. So, you know... But there's a lot more information here about that. Paul talked about it in Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7, 11, um, and uh, what you might call it, um, uh, Ephesians 6. He spent a lot of time on it in Ephesians 5 and 6. Okay? So Peter's talking back to that. Okay? Church of the Firstborn in Book of Hebrews. Okay, so now, again, all this stuff, end of things is near. See, near. Angus. Is it Angus or Utus? See, he's using one of the two terms. Angus, I think. Angizo. Angizo. That's where we get the word Angus from. That's a key word in Mark's Gospel. All right. I mean, he uses it like a bazillion times. I documented all the times he used it in videos already. All right. Got to make sure I'm still recording because it suddenly turns off. All right. So the end of all things is near. You you see, if it's 68 A.D. and they're expecting the rapture any minute, because the temple is supposed to go down at year 40. All right. Or depending on how you count the years. All right, maybe three years later, and Paul had documented the possibility of both in his own meter in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. You can see why Peter's writing in such a hurry. Okay? Get ready, get ready, get ready. Okay, and these are all behavioral stuff. And then again, he keeps on saying, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. See, because if, if the church is going to go up, and they know that... that you know, the tribulation is going to start to reinstate the time to the Jews, then it isn't going to be easy on the Christians either in the last few years. Okay? Because Satan's time is also going to be up also. Because the minute the tribulation starts, Satan knows he's only got, you know, short time left. So what he's going to want to do is, you know, take as many Christians down as possible. Okay? So that's why he's talking like this. And of course, you know, 68 AD, Paul had just been killed. So now there's going to be a pogrom. All right. And in Second Peter, he tells you he knows he's going to die as a result. So, you know, the pogrom from Nero was already started. All right. See? So that's why he's talking so much about suffering. That explains the impetus of his letter. That also explains why Hebrews is talking about the same thing. Household of God. See? For it is time for judgment to begin. Yeah. They're expecting the rapture to happen. And the minute the rapture happens, we get judged. If it begins with us first, what about those who don't obey? The tribulation. Okay? So, so he's totally motivated by... An expectation that the rapture is going to happen. 
okay? And then he quotes to prove what he was saying. That's a quote. That's what I like about the NASB, is they put their quotes in, in caps, okay? So then he's saying, look, elders, and see, partaker, that's a, a term that's used in um, Hebrews 3.14. He stresses that. He also uses that to stress hupostasis as a nickname for Christ in the book of Hebrews. Um, in Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 3.14, and Hebrews 11.1, 1, which is mistranslated. Okay? So now there's all behavior now. See? See, when the shepherd appears, because it can be any minute. <coughs> Unfading crown of glory, that was in James. Okay? <coughs> Sorry, I'm allergic to the change in seasons. Younger men, behavior. John will be talking back to this when 30 years later the rapture still hasn't happened. Okay? One of my favorite verses right here. Okay? Be alert. Yeah, because the rapture can happen any second. All right, this is in First Peter. All right, and then Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Is this John Mark who wrote the Mark Gospel? The church fathers thought so. There's no actual proof of it, but if so, then it explains a lot. Okay, it means that Timothy went to Babylon when Paul died to pick up Mark. That's how Peter knew about what was going to happen to him. He writes his letters. Maybe they take them back to Paul. Well, no, 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 they didn't. No, sorry, back. P Timothy picks up Mark. That can't be the same Mark then. That's it. Unless Mark came back after um, Paul died. Maybe that's the point. Maybe Mark came back after Paul died, and that's why he First Peter is written. Okay, all right. So we got a different chronology. Okay, end of Second Timothy. I got to change this. End of Second Timothy. Our boy, um, Paul, writes to Timothy saying, "Bring Mark." Okay, if Mark was in Babylon, he might not have been. He could have been someplace else. Timothy, in any event, picks up Mark, goes to Rome, is with Paul, and then somehow, along the way, you know, Timothy gets imprisoned. Either Mark was imprisoned too or wasn't, presuming that he wasn't or he got released before Timothy did. Maybe he goes back to Peter. Peter then gets his notice, hi, I'm going to die. Or at least writes First Peter before he knows he's going to die. Mark is with him at that time after Paul's dead. Okay. And then maybe that's the impetus for Mark's gospel. Church Father sure thought so. But then I don't place much, I don't have much respect for the Church Fathers. Because it's so easy for them to lie. They make up such blatant lies with no conscience. They make up stories, they make up blatant lies, they twist scripture with, with no conscience whatsoever. So I don't really, you know, ascribe to much that the church fathers thought was true or untrue. Okay. And then, in any event, at the time he writes this, Mark is there. So is Mark there after Paul dies? Well, he must be. Okay, so then, is, if it's the same Mark, then he got out and went to Peter, maybe told Peter that Paul was dead. And maybe Timothy was still in jail at that time. That could be, all right? Then he writes his second letter, and it's a lot more sedate, okay? We have all of his promises. No more hurry about, oh, the end might come. Okay, he's talking about, this is a play on um, Ephesians 4, uh, no, Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. Okay, he's, he's doing a sort of building explanation. Okay, this should be translated, 
for he who lacks these qualities having forgotten having forgotten to take the word to take is not in the translation but should be the Greek word there is labon let me show you this is a really serious translation area error okay hold on see right here it should say having forgotten to take purification for his sins meaning the equivalent of one John one nine because in one because taking purification for sins in the Old Testament meant that you brought an animal and then while the animal was slain you named your sins to God okay well since there are no animals now that you can take to a priest then you still just name your sins to God and labon means to take it's a participle having forgotten the taking of his purification from sins which is the equivalent of 1 John 1 9 okay so the person who, who isn't doing the above is because he's carnal all right and now you'll notice he's not rushing them anymore all right enters into the eternal kingdom abundantly supplied to you so he feels that there's going to be more time now and then I'll always be ready to remind you of these things as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling because why he knows he's gonna die soon that's why he's so relaxed I mean I, hopefully you notice he's very relaxed versus the first letter okay and I will also be diligent that anytime after my departure that you will remember these things okay that's all personal stuff okay then he says we didn't follow clever fables but we got this directly from God okay this is the passage that the Catholics all distort okay men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God it's not by an act of human will God gave it to us all right God gave it to us not some institution God to men not a Pope Peter's not a Pope he's not in he's not in Rome he's in Babylon if he was in Rome he'd be dead because Paul is dead Peter's not in Rome he's writing because Paul is dead and Paul was in Rome okay and now he gets to the famous thing that's in the book of Jude about false prophets so now his agenda in talking is different the false prophets are going to come because this is his deathbed letter he's now explaining to them what's going to happen I've gone through that so I'm not going to revisit it again but now look second letter I'm writing to you stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken before and by the holy prophets this is the the the, the prophets and the commandment okay this part here he's he's that's his nickname for the whole of canon to date all right last days mockers will come all right Jude talks back to that all right now see remember in first Peter it's all in a hurry he's gonna come he's gonna come he's gonna come this must have been a few months later all right they were expecting it right away it didn't happen there was an elapse of time yeah because because Paul's executed sometime in the summer of 68 okay Nero was still alive by January okay so maybe there's like a six month elapse here and so now the scoffers are saying well where is it where is it where's the promise of his coming it's still the same okay and that's why he says he talks about the flood again coming at the last minute all right talks about the flood again and this is again a quote from Psalm 90 verse 4 that he's playing back to his own first letter okay Lord is not slow about his promise okay see the temple's not down yet all right but Paul died the temple's not down yet it's supposed to go down the third year of the tribulation that's Daniel 9 27 so they were expecting the tribulation any day they were expecting the rapture to happen any day. 
So that's why they're saying, where's the promise of his coming? In other words, where's the rapture? <clears throat> okay? Because you know how people are. It's like with the stupid Mayan thing. I don't know where anybody thought that that was a valid thing to talk about even. Oh, 12, 21, 12. The world's coming to an end. Okay, and then we're sitting there at 12, 22, 12. Saying, well, what happened? All right. Paul died. It can happen right away. Okay, well, Paul's been dead for a while between 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Well, it didn't happen. So then there's no rapture at all because it didn't happen when we expected it. Never mind that the Lord himself said in first in Acts 1.5, you can't tell when it's going to happen. You don't know the day or hour. You only know it's going to happen. And it's up to Father when it's going to happen. That's in Acts 1. Okay, so now Peter is answering the scoffers here. All right? The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness but is patient, okay? The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Of course, this is echoed in, in Revelation, all right? And the book of Hebrews elaborates on all this. It's elaborating on all this. The whole point of the book of Hebrews is to explain why the rapture is imminent. That's, that's its whole point, okay? And it ends with the Attic Crytone in Hebrews 11, 39 through 40, that apart from us, they, the Old Testament people, will not be resurrected. In other words, Second Advent can't come until we're finished. All right? But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth. So you look for these things. All right? And regard the patience of our Lord as deliverance. I mean, the whole letter of Hebrews is wrapping around this. See? And then he said, just as Paul wrote to you. Now, what did Paul write? Paul wrote out a line by line, year by year, rapture hood likelihood scenario. And I, I showed it in the meter of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. He knocked it out. Paul knocked out the likelihood of the rapture year by year by year and then told you what the history of Rome would be and told you the history of the rise of the Roman Catholic Church so that year by year you could track the likelihood of the rapture. I documented that already beginning in my GGS video 11A and I've gotten up as far as Constantine. I haven't finished them yet. Okay, so of course he's going to talk about Paul as also in all of his letters, which are some things hard to understand, but the untaught and unstable distort. Okay? And then here's his deathbed, growing grace. All right? That's exactly what Hebrews is tracking to. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't notice that until now. So all those things I said before about Hebrews being first is wrong. Peter is first, Jude is second, Hebrews is either third or fourth, with Mark being third or fourth as a gospel. That's it. That's all I know how to say. As far as I'm concerned, this is conclusive. Peace out.